Good morning, or perhaps it's afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, Team McCleary, two professors, A.M. McCleary, interestingly enough, um, are speaking uh, about uh, Megan Ray Blakely's um, paper. Um, we heard a clear, uh, comprehensive, and concise uh, exposition of the nature and context of intangible cultural heritage and the challenges uh, surrounding its protection and safeguarding. Uh, these challenges comprise a fundamental paradox Tantification of ICH appears necessary to protect it uh, because it has to be precisely defined um, with its form pinned down. Um, and that precise definition uh, starts a process which tends to fix it, something which of course is inimical to the concept of evolution of intangible cultural heritage and surely, uh, colleagues, living culture must be evolving uh, to live. Um, so, so that's a fundamental paradox which is difficult to overcome. Um, Tantification is not the sole issue for ICH um, and cultural memory. In fact, it's the thin end of a wedge, um, a wedge which leads in, inexorably, inexorably um, to propertization, um, to commercialization, to commodification, um, and as, uh, as Megan uh, so erudately explained, commercialization. Uh, uh, these are not all inevitably bad um, in every context, but they have to be very carefully handled. Um, furthermore, they take us into uh, even more hostile territory where all sorts of issues like authenticity, ownership, cultural appropriation, hybridization, uh, and finally, ethics and morality and immorality um, uh, rear their extremely ugly heads. Um, so what's the answer? Um, I know a lot of questions, um, and Megan posed a great number of questions very clearly. Um, how do we find an answer to this um, paradox? Um, perhaps if I hand this to the other Professor McCleary, he might be able to supply that answer. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm going to do is briefly outline a case study that I've actually discussed with Megan, and it's the case study of um, Maori face. Uh, tattoos, the, the moko. Some of you will be familiar with those wonderful insights into the male psyche, the hangover films, and you will know that in the first of the hangover films, Mike Tyson appears, and he has a Maori uh, moko on the side of his face. In Hangover 2, the um, director decided that it would be funny if one of the characters woke up from his drunken state with a similar moko on his face. When that film came out, the original tattooist, Brian Whitmill, who had done Tyson's tattoo, then sued um, the studios for breach of copyright. He claimed that the tattoo on Tyson's face was his copyright. It was in fixed form. Um, he had been the creator of it, and they'd copied it without attribution or payment. Legal opinion at the time seemed to suggest that, yes, a tattoo was capable of copyright, but like most things, the case was settled out of, out of court and never actually went to judgment. And there it may have ended as a kind of neat case study for students of copyright law. But there was one voice absent from that whole procedure, and that was the Maoris themselves, who were incensed by two things. One, that someone should claim ownership over a traditional practice that was theirs. And indeed, from a legal point of view, I think the studio could have defended what they did on grounds of lack of originality, even though the threshold for that is set pretty low in um, Anglo-Saxon practice. But the Maoris were angry. They were angry because no one had consulted them to say, you know, do you own this? Because they felt they did, not as individuals, but as a community. They were incensed because the notion that someone could copyright um, the Mako meant because of trips that then um, Maoris having their faces tattooed in New Zealand might in turn be sued um, for breach of copyright by Brian Whitmill or any other tattooist who got first in and saying, I, I own this. And so there's a, a great difficulty here, as Megan pointed out, between on the one hand the legal world with its concepts of individual ownership and then the right to exploit. And then the view of communities and their sense of 
more communal collective ownership of practices like tattooing or wood carving or the telling of stories and how they then can be taken over and taken away from these communities. And I think again, as Alison left you with questions, I would leave you with a challenge. And that is, how do you recognize the rights of these communities? Communities of craftspeople, of storytellers, of um, artisans, how do you recognize their rights within a world system that is geared towards this kind of notion of individual ownership? So I'm, I'm responding to Kerry's uh, fascinating presentation on the Edwin Morgan, Morgan scrapbooks. Um, I'd like to, although it seems quite an extreme um, project, I, I think it's absolutely typical of the kinds of materials that sit in libraries, archives, museums. The British Library has, you know, we have scrapbooks of newspaper um, articles from, that were collected by Chatham House over decades. Again, individual articles removed from, from, from their original context. We've, we've um, wanting to digitise, you know, letters, photographs, collections of materials that organisations and individuals have, have, have kept over the years fanzines, club, club magazines, you know, these have high research value. Um, and I think it's fair to say that our copyright system is not based around the kind of things that, that we, saw, we see in these projects. Um, you know, it's based around material that is, is or the way it, copyright has developed is, is it works if you're trying to get permission to, to reuse a Beatles track or, or something that where the rights holders can be quickly quickly found, but that isn't the case with a lot of the material um, that we see there. A couple of thoughts. One is, I wonder if we'd even be having the presentation if this was in America or South Korea or Israel at fair use countries. Um, so, so we don't have an exception in UK copyright law that, 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 that helps this kind of thing. Um, I think Kerry showed very adeptly that the orphan works uh, exception wasn't the solution, the time, the scale, the cost, the cost for doing this. And inevitably, you know, as you said in, showed in the slides, depending on um, your appetite for risk, um, large parts would have to be redacted. So orphan works would lead, lead, leave a very big a big hole. So we don't have an exception. The orphan works would only get us, you know, a few images perhaps per page. <laughs> um, and, and I'm very interested in extended collective licensing, um, a form of licensing which allows uh, collecting societies to extend their mandate in certain instances uh, beyond um, be, beyond their members. So I'm wondering if you've spoken to the design artists collecting societies or any artistic collecting society to see to see their their take on it. Um, I think again we have issues there that the law was introduced in October 2014. Nearly two years later, not one collecting society has has applied for an extended collective license. So actually, they haven't applied for their business as usual. So, and particularly if you look at the CRM directive and, and, and the, the, the requirements on transparency, the high bar that collecting societies have to um, jump over in order to apply for an extended collective license. I wonder when, if, um, this, this, this country will be in a position like the French, the Germans, the Swedes, the Danes, the Poles, a lot of other European countries that seem to have um, found legal solutions for, for large-scale digitization. So I'm not really sure where that leaves us <laughs> in terms of um, copyright law. In, in, in the Edwin Morgan uh, example, we haven't got an exception. Orphan works isn't the solution. We don't have an extended collective license. So copyright just doesn't seem to be able to cope with the kinds of things that the archives are doing um, in, in, in this sort of high research um, interest, interest space. 
Again, if it was the Beatles, we wouldn't have a problem. We could clear the, the, those rights quite easily. So a crazy idea that I came up with <laughs> is moving away from, not moving entirely away from copyright law, but um, it, it, can, can we have a, perhaps a committee of the great and the good that a, where there isn't a license available for in copyright material like this scrapbook, where, where the exceptions are not, are not working, that actually sits down and decides actually is it the cultural value of, of this material that, that's important or, or, or is it the, the, the exclusive rights of, 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 of each rights holder? Maybe, maybe that's a way that we can um, move beyond the, the sort of copyright impasse that, that we seem, or the difficulties that we have at the moment in terms of this, this category of material that was not produced commercially. A thought. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So I have great pleasure in responding to uh, Victoria's presentation. Um, I am a great believer in, um, and actually, as a result of the work that I do across the sector, that in a 21st century cultural heritage organisation, whether it's an archive or museum or library, um, that we have to consider that rights management means risk management. There's no other way around that. And um, Victoria's presentation, and in fact um, the presentation um, before hers, was very much focusing on um, the role of risk management and um, looking at copyright through the lens of a business decision, which is that in order to achieve what we want to do, achieve digitization, connect with our public, make these works available because often we don't have the physical space to put them online, uh, to put them, sorry, out on display, but we do online. Uh, we have to take very thoughtful decisions with regards to how much does it cost, what is the benefit, and what are the risks. So the magic triangle of costs, risks, and benefits, I think, is a, a resounding um, discussion. It's an ongoing discussion that we need to have in an organization. Now, what's also, I think, quite important to stress, and, and this was also picked up by Victoria, but also in some of the other um, presentations, uh, is that we are not a homogenous sector, that organizations function very differently, and Something that might be cheap in one organization will be expensive in another. And so it is also very difficult to come up with specific models that apply universally. But what we can do, I believe, is come up with principles that we can then apply and then they can be spoke according to the um, individual organizations. Now, um, I wrote a report back in 2009 called In From The Cold, which was one of the first uh, reports ever written looking at the extent and impact of orphan works on public service delivery. And I wanted to read you something from the report, which is uh, just over six years old now. And I had it outlined beautifully, of course, before the presentation. Okie doke. So, um, often works are selected for digitization based on the fact that they do not pose any copyright issues, thus creating a black hole of 20th century content. These issues stress the need for an informed and skilled public sector to deal with all the issues associated with copyright related materials, the necessity for access to resources to deal with orphan works, and an informed and proportionate understanding of the nature of the risks associated with the use of these works. Now this is six years ago. This is after a massive change to UK copyright legislation. This is after our 2014 orphan works licensing scheme and orphan works exceptions and the issues are the same. Now, Victoria's study is crucial because it corroborates work that was carried out a while ago both in terms of highlighting those issues but also if you if you look through her figures 
um, Victoria found that on average archives have between 40 to 50 percent of their items being orphan works. Now this hasn't changed but the costs associated with dealing with them are greater now than they ever were before. And so her report and all the work that she's doing is highlighting the issues that we're facing, which are the growing costs at a time when our sector has reduced capacity to fulfill those costs. So it's a very, very important piece of work. Now, what I'm also interested in, and I think that's something that, um, again, looking like Ben at possible solutions for some of the issues that have been flagged are the causes of orphan works. Now, one of the major causes of orphan works in the UK, certainly for text-based works, is the duration of copyright in unpublished text-based works. Now, in certain circumstances, and this is irrespective of when they were created, certain works can be in copyright until the end of the year 2039. And this is one of the reasons why we have so many orphan works in our archives. And in response to this, and this is the final thing that I will say, um, the Libraries and Archives Copyright Alliance on Monday launched a survey looking at the cost, cost to the sector of 2039 works. Now I will tweet again, I've been tweeting all week, the link to the survey, but I would really urge any of you who have uh, text-based works in your collections, if you are archives or museums or libraries, to complete the survey. Because like Ben, we have to be proactive in trying to seek the changes that we need in order for copyright to work more effectively for us. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, you're also from Europe. Yeah. Yes, hello. Uh, and I'm responding on the uh, last presentation by uh, Andrea. Um, so first of all, yes, I have to give uh, compliments to uh, what you've done here with uh, all the prints. It's, it's very pretty and I think it's exactly why we um, digitize material because you're now able to pull in these works that are scattered all over the world into a room in uh, Glasgow. And um, so um, with Europeana, we, uh, we advocate for maintaining a healthy and thriving public domain. And that all starts with the question if digitization uh, actually generates new copyright. And um, for example, in the Netherlands, if you would make a two-dimensional scan of a painting, you would have a pretty hard time actually claiming copyright on that picture, as is no original work. And I think in the UK, more and more, it goes into that direction. But um, Naomi knows more about that. Um, but, um, and that's what's clearly also been seen in this uh, exhibition, is that institutions think quite differently about it and not, um, and not uh, in a standardized way. So you have all these public domain works, but all um, here with different right statements. And um, for example, I, I, this is not only here, but this is on, in European on a much larger scale. I looked up uh, th that painting by Munch over there. He is in the public domain for two years now. We have 190 works of Munch on Europeana, of which five are labeled public domain, nine CC by SA, three CC by NC, 14 CC by NC and D, and 146 all rights reserved. So <laughs> that shows a bit that the institutions take a very different approach um, and uh, in, in claiming their the making rights statements. And it's interesting to see in this presentation that our kind of open champions are also still, still struggling. We have the Rijksmuseum, which is always used as a great example of opening up high resolution collections. But uh, as Andrea showed, they even have issues with just keeping up with new policies, which then mean there's a legacy problem because previously, probably in the metadata, they have put down copyright Rijksmuseum. Um, so this is one of the reasons why um, we at Europeana, but with many other organizations, advocate for the standardization of rights statements. Um, we have been doing this since 2011 now, um, and we're actually forcing every institution to pick one of the 13 rights statements that we offer. Um, so there's some form of standardization, but as I just told you with the Munch example, there's still a great form of variety. And um, then there's also the DC rights field, which is an open text field, which is very often still conflicting with the right statements chosen. Um, or sometimes just very weird. We have a collection where it says uh, public domain, but in DC rights it says for rights information, please tweet at this personal Twitter account. Um, right, so 
Um, I think finally, uh, opening up collections, opening up content, uh, we talk a lot about copyright here, but I have to say that uh, it's more than just uh, putting a right statement on top of something. Um, there is a large deal in opening up is uh, how do you make stuff accessible? Do you make it easy enough for a user to go to your collection on your website and to find the material? Because if you don't, probably they'll find it somewhere else. I mean, again, uh, the question, does digitization generate new copyright? There are a lot of people that think it doesn't, like most famous, uh, the Wikimedia Foundation. So they take public domain works, two-dimensional public domain works, put it on Wikimedia Commons with a public domain stamp on it. And if it, for a user, I think in the end, if he looks for a particular painting, he doesn't really care uh, where he finds it. He wants to find it in the best resolution and with the best uh, terms of use. Um, so actually that I think would be a, a quite a nice exercise to follow up on this exhibition to do the same thing with the exact same artworks but this time um, with all the sources you can find including Flickr, Wikimedia Commons and probably nearly everything here will be in super high resolution. Um, final comment is that uh, this comes a bit back to the uh, conflicting rights payments. I really like the idea and of the, uh, the archive of uh, copy that. So instead of writing something down like this is in copyright and then two years later you change your policy and you have to do it all over again, you can simply link to that page in your metadata and people can see, ah, right, back then it was like this, right now if I find it, um, this is the situation of the institution. I think that will be a great help in um, yeah, standardizing these kinds of things. Um, yeah, that was it, thanks. Um, well, I get the pleasure of going last, so um, uh, before we open up to questions, I guess. So, uh, Margaret Haig from the Intellectual Property Office, um, and before you start throwing things at me, um, we obviously appreciate that there are lots of issues around um, this area, and actually it's very useful for us to attend events like this, um, look at the presentations, the research that's being done, um, to actually understand the context, um, what's happening. Um, and I've met with um, various institutions and looked at various projects over, over the time I've been at the IPO and have seen for myself that um, some of the things you struggle with. Um, I would um, encourage you to, um, one of the things that really struck me about um, Andy's uh, presentation there at the end is about public awareness, but I think it's also about specialist awareness. Um, and yeah, it's great to get people to be engaging with art, but actually all of you to be understanding what the other policies are out there in terms of what people have on their websites. I think probably, you know, um, as um, uh, practitioners, you're, you want to put things out there, you want to put things on your um, websites, not realizing that there is an underlying terms and conditions on your website that says X, Y, Z, um, that would be restrictive. And so I would really encourage you to get involved with your um, legal teams, which was also something um, uh, that came up in the other presentations. Um, <laughs> In terms of uh, government work, we ha did put some exceptions in place um, a couple of years ago, 2014, um, which hopefully helped the, the uh, cultural heritage sector, um, things about preservation and archiving. Uh, we did put in place the Orphan Works licensing scheme. We have got an extended collective licensing structure, although no one's made an application, I appreciate that. Um, so there are things that we are trying to do to help you. And one thing I would say is, you know, looking to the future, um, you, uh, obviously I have to slightly disregard what's happening in a couple of weeks time but um, in the EU the, the digital single market package um, is expected to have some uh, uh, content which will be relevant to cultural heritage sector so what I would say now is just sort of keep an eye out for what's happening on that level um, and engage when you can um, about influencing that and, and what that will actually look like I won't say too much more now, obviously if people have questions about particular government policies, about particular things, then we can take those in panel. So if people have questions. Uh, Fiona McMillan from um, Birkbeck University of London. Um, I, I just wanted to um, make a couple of comments which have a couple of questions attached about the trajectory of the UNESCO Conventions on Cultural Heritage. And this relates, I think, uh, partly to the things that Megan said about this and also um, to the specific points that were raised by both of the Professor McCleary, McCle Mc McCleary, is that right? Sorry. Um, in response to that, that um, presentation. The first one uh, relates to this 
a convention that hardly anyone mentions, but it's worth saying something about in this, and this is the Convention on the Protection, strangely, of Underwater Cultural Heritage, which is not relevant to this, but has in it a provision on anti-commercialization. So something, so it actually creates a commons around underwater cultural heritage. And I think it would be useful if we said a little bit more about this, this story and why, why it's there and why it doesn't exist, for example, in the Intangible Cultural Heritage Convention. So, that was, so that's really a general comment. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to say, and it relates to this example of the Moku and of the Maori people and another problem that we might, and Megan may have something to say about this, about the Intangible Cultural Heritage Convention, sorry, I've almost finished, sorry, um, which, is, which is that the other problem is that community, um, Megan talked about this problem about cultural heritage of humanity versus cultural heritage of community, which is a problem that runs through all the UNESCO conventions. Um, but indigenous people, but not only indigenous people, have a special problem, which is to have their cultural heritage listed, they have to get into a relationship with their own government, with whom they often have a very bad relationship. At Maori people a bit less so. Australian Indigenous people don't want it. Or Australia's not a party to the convention, but they don't want to use. They don't want to be in this relationship where they have to ask the government to list their heritage in ways that they might not like. But not only them, also people in Venice, the Venetian gondola builders, have exactly the same problem with the Italian government. So another problem that maybe someone has something to say about is what we do about this idea that actually what the UNESCO conventions ask us to think about is culture as a national thing, not as a, a culture of heritage of humanity, not as community, but as a, as a nation. I agree largely with, with what, what you said, and in fact, uh, I can add two further examples. One is the issue in Australia is over petroglyphs, it's over Aborigine um, paintings, and who has the right to reproduce these, and there have been some notable cases where um, gallery owners in, uh, in Australia have been reproducing Aborigine petroglyphs and then selling them much to, again, the anger of their Aborigine community. Um, but I'd also say that there is no necessary um, tension or antagonism between commercialization on the one hand and the requirements of uh, the UNESCO Convention. Um, Murano Glass, anyone know where Murano Glass comes from? Yeah, <laughs> which, which is where? It's an island of, island of Venice. Well, that, that's wrong, actually. Most Murano glass comes from China and Pakistan. And the um, glass manufacturers in Murano, which are commercial enterprises, artisan enterprises, have a real problem even, even in Venice itself because a lot of the glass that you buy in Venice as you come off your cruise ship and have half an hour to go and... and visit the stalls in the Rialto comes from Pakistan and China. And they are, um, without recourse, they, they can't defend their rights in Murano, in Murano glass. They cannot claim any rights in it. The best they can do is the Murano glass they make, they put a label on it saying authentic Murano glass. But unless you're a particularly discriminating tourist and look for the label, you can't tell it. So sometimes the defense of uh, communities of craftspeople and, and others involved in ICH is, is not, as it were, to um, defend them against commercialization, but to defend their primary rights to commercialize the products of their communities, the traditions that they've developed. I would just like to make a separate, perhaps rather trite comment that um, UNESCO, of the UNESCO Convention on ICH is based in Paris. Paris is the capital of France. France, as we all know, is a very centralized country, um, and uh, from time immemorial, France has had great difficulty at governmental level in recognizing uh, the identities and cultural heritages uh, of its various regions, and that is a tension which is ongoing. And if I could bring it back to copyright, in that um, we've spoken a lot about the sort of conventions and treaties that exist and that surround our cultural heritage, but I think it's also worth um, giving a sense as well that within any cultural heritage organization, there are also a number of standards that we, uh, we are um, compelled to, if we want to actually achieve the levels of funding that we need. So there are archive, there's archive accreditation, there's museum accreditation, there are also commitments that museums, libraries and archives have 
to um, their funding bodies, like the Heritage Lottery Fund and Arts Council England. They have um, agreements um, with people who give them money to buy stuff, so that might be the art fund. Um, they also have agreements with people who give them the stuff as well. And so that broader context that's been discussed today is also very, very important to be aware that there are both international, national, and other types of agreements and commitments that organizations have that ultimately have an impact as well on what goes online and how that's communicated. So it all sort of filters through. Ruth Taus, uh, I'm um, an economist working on culture. Uh, well, there's been lots of discussion on risk, which is of course a very normal problem for economists. Risk consists of the probability of an event happening and the, the damages. And I wonder if there have been any... Uh, and now, I understand that this is not an all, always an economic problem because reputation is also involved, but I wonder if there have been any sort of attempts to work out what the sort of probabilities of, uh, of this, uh, you know, of being um, uh, um, sort of caught out doing the wrong thing uh, are, uh, and what, what, the, what the cost would be for that. Um, now, that, of course, is normally covered in, the real, in ordinary life by insurance. Um, and I'm not suggesting that an individual insurer, you know, that a commercial insurance policy would be interested in this. But the government does have uh, indemnity insurance policies for all kinds of things associated uh, with the art world. And I wonder if this might be a kind of channel uh, to go down to consider that um, it might make it more attractive to smaller institutions particularly if they knew that there was some sort of covering uh, of their backs uh, in case of, uh, of infringement. There has been some work done on this area. Um, I can tell you that some of the organisations that I work with have taken out insurance against copyright risk and that is a matter of a few hundred pounds a year. So there is that available and uh, some of the big insurers like Hiscox are now aware of the types of issues that they face and are prepared to give that insurance. We've effectively got government insurance through the Orphan Works licensing scheme because that is an insurance um, situation. And also in terms of calculating risks, I did some work um, about four years ago for um, GISC, which, is, which was a, a, a sort of funding body then, um, supporting the open education resource projects and we created a risk management calculator for trying to calculate the risks associated with both putting orphan works online and also the different risks in terms of a spectrum um, of risks associated with the different types of creative commons that those uh, licenses that those orphan works may go out under. Now, this was something that was discussed between myself um, and my team who comprised of copyright practitioners, uh, Charles Oppenheim, who's in the audience as well, was part of the team, and we also had lawyers on our team as well. Um, we didn't get as far as quantifying the costs, because I think that's almost the next step, but we did take it some way to try and give the sector a tool to provide an indicative level of risk associated with that type of activity. And I mean, can I just ask, okay, the, the kind of figures you're talking about there, a couple of hundred pounds for a policy, is that it relating to non-commercial activity by an institution or also commercial activities as well? Um, for one organisation um, that I work with, it's for putting um, thousands, hundreds of thousands of artworks online um, for non-commercial purposes. And another organisation I work with, it's covering all their copyright related risks as part of a bigger insurance policy that they have, yeah, absolutely. Um, just anecdotal experience, we, we, we have tried to get um, in insurance, which is difficult for a public sector body, we're told that we, for this particular purpose we cannot um, and get, get, get insurance, but we did um, go against what our lawyers were saying and try to get insurance from people like Hiscox and it essentially went into the doesn't compute box. We were not able to get any quotes back. Okay. 
Yeah, this is more about um, calculating risk. A nice case, I think, uh, or it's not that nice, but a good example is from uh, the National Library of the Netherlands. They had a set of uh, magazines from 1880 till the start of the First World War, so very similar to uh, the scrapbook collection, basically. Loads of authors, uh, photographers uh, in one set. And um, because of the dates, it's quite likely that like 95% of what's in there would be in, out of copyright and in the public domain, but they weren't sure. Um, so they calculated how long will it take us to actually find out all the rights holders, and that this was about uh, five years for two full-time people. So quite expensive. So instead, they figured, let's reverse it, and we're going to announce it, we're going to put everything online, and if you are a potential rights holder, let us know, and we can work something out before we publish, either by taking it out or by giving you some kind of uh, compensation. And uh, they did that for a while before publishing, and I got uh, one response from a guy that was actually really happy that his granddad's stuff was finally going to be online. But also a letter from a collective rights management organization in the Netherlands that said, you can't work like this, we have rights holders, you need to pay us. And they said, well, okay, then give us the list of names and we can start checking. And they said, no, no, we don't need to give you that list. It's just how things work. You need to pay us because you're going to publish this. And uh, in the end, uh, lawyers came in and they decided because the works were, commercially speaking, so uninteresting, it's really difficult to make money out of 18th, uh, 20, uh, early uh, 20th century magazines, that they could put it up with like a huge clause saying you can read it, use it for research, but not uh, for commercial purposes. And that's where it's at now. So it didn't really solve anything, but that's the risk they took. Uh, and they, from rights holders, they got nothing but from collective rights management organizations, they did. At Create, but actually I'm also a solicitor and my question comes from more from my background as a solicitor. Um, is there any widespread view on who actually drafts all these contracts that we've been talking about today? Um, is it lawyers? Is it people in-house? Is it people working for small organizations that just copy what another organization's done and then tweak things to make it work for their situation? Do we, do we know what's happening? It depends on the resources that the organisation has. So some of the bigger national museums will create their own and they might either get their internal law teams to do it or they'll bring in outside lawyers. Um, as we sort of go down the, in terms of resource um, a, a capability, um, the less resources, the more likelihood that people will copy from each other because it's just they don't have the capacity to have in-house legal teams whoops, or even, um, or even to, br to bring people in to do it. That's my experience anyway, don't know if the panel. Can I just add something as well? And I, this is, because this is, this is the space I live and breathe in. I, I do this day in, day out, this whole thing. But I'm working right now with um, two organizations, uh, one a national museum and, and another non-national museum to help them to open up their images. Um, in other words, to help them put images of their collections online under a Creative Commons license. And in both situations, these are three-year projects. Because what I think what people don't realize in many cases is that the decision is only the first part of the story. So organizationally, agreeing what they want to do is only the first bit. After that, it's about looking at the data that they hold in their collections management systems and making sure that that's fit for purpose, making sure that they've got procedures in place in order to understand what rights need to be cleared um, in works that are in copyright so that, they, so that they can then deliver that material under Creative Commons licenses, making sure they've got the right templates in place to do that, making sure they've got a policy in place so that everyone understands their roles and responsibilities, and then making sure that there's training so that there is, they can basically keep this going. And this takes so much time, so much effort, and it costs so much. And I really wanted to say that, that what you see in terms of the delivery of items online under Creative Commons licenses, it's not because the sector doesn't want to do it. It really, really does. But the costs involved in getting there are so substantial that it's taking much longer, I think, than anyone realizes in order to get to that point.